Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Vasali in the great wood in the hall with a peaked roof. Now on that occasion Sachika, the Niganta's son, was staying at Vasali, a debater, a clever speaker, regarded by many as a saint. <coughs> he was making this statement before the Vasali assembly. I see no recluse or Brahmin, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, even one claiming to be accomplished and fully awakened, who would not shake, shiver, and tremble, and sweat under the armpits if he were to engage in debate with me. Even if I were to engage a senseless post in debate, it would shake, shiver, and tremble. If it were engaged in debate with me, so what shall I say of a human being? He'll get his come up and you'll see. <laughs> uh, Niganta's son, he is... Uh, did you ever go see Sai Baba when he was in India no. before he died? Okay, you know about him though. Okay, this is, he's from the same same uh, tradition as Nigantha Nakuta. Then when it was morning, the venerable Asaji, dressed and taking a, his bowl and his outer robe, went into Vasali for alms as Sachika, the Niganta's son, was walking and wandering for exercise in Vasali, he saw the venerable Asaji. Asaji is the first one to become awakened. He was listened at the first Dhamma talk and became a Sotapanna, later to become uh, Arahat. Coming in the distance, he went to him, exchanged greetings with him, when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, Sachika, the Nigantha's son, stood at one side and said to him, Master Asaji, how does the recluse Gotama discipline his disciples? And how is the recluse Gotama's instruction usually presented to his disciples? This is how the Blessed One's disciple disciplines his disciples, Satrika. <coughs> and this is how the Blessed One instruction is usually presented to his disciples. For monks, material form is impermanent, feeling is Im impermanent, perception is impermanent, formations are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. Now, if I was to say to somebody that asked that kind of question, I wouldn't say permanent or impermanent. I would say impersonal. Why? Because that gives you a better idea of what the actual teaching of the Buddha was was uh, giving. When you say that these things are impersonal, then that would give you the idea that there is no permanent self. There is only this impersonal perspective of how things work. Monks, material form is not self. Okay, same thing. Material feeling is not self. Perception is not self. Formations are not self. Consciousness is not self. All formations are impermanent. All things are not self. That is how the Blessed One disciplines his disciples. That is how the Blessed One instructs instruction is usually presented to his disciples. If I had heard what the recluse Gotama asserts, we would in, 
we would have indeed heard what is disagreeable. Perhaps sometime or other we might meet Master Gotama and have some conversation with him. Perhaps we might detach him from that evil view. Now at that time, 500 Lekavis had met together in an assembly hall for some business or other. Then Sachika, the Nigata son, went to them and said, Come forth, good Lekavis, come forth. Today there will be some conversation between me and the recluse Gotama. If the recluse Gotama maintains before what has been maintained before by me, by one of his famous disciples, the, the bhikkhu named Asaji, then just as a strong man might seize a long-haired ram by the hair and drag him to and drag him fro, and drag him round about, so in debate I will drag the recluse Gotama <clears throat> too, and I will drag him fro and drag him round about just as a strong brewer's workman might throw a big brewer's sieve in deep into a well, water well and taking it by the corners drag it to and drag it fro and drag it round about. So in debate I will drag the recluse Gotama too and drag him fro and drag him round about just as a strong brewer's mixer might take a strainer by the corners and shake it, uh, shake it down and shake it up and thump it about. So in debate, I will shake the recluse Gotama down and shake him up and thump him about. And just as a 60-year-old elephant might plunge deep into a pond and enjoy playing the game of hemp washing, so I shall enjoy play the, playing the game of hemp washing with a recluse Gotama. Come forth, good Lekavis, come forth. Today there will be conversation between me and the recluse Gotama. Thereupon some Lekavis said, who is the recluse Gotama that he, you, he could refute Sachika, the Nigata's son? On the contrary, Sachika, the Nigata's son, will refute the recluse Gotama's assertions. And some Lekave said, Who is Sachika, the Nigata's son, that he would refute the Blessed One's assertions? On the contrary, the Blessed One will refute Sachika the Nigantha son's assertions. Then Sachika the Nigantha son went with 500 Lekavis to the hall with the peaked roof in the great wood. Now on that occasion a number of monks were walking up and down in the open. Then Sachika the Nigantha son <coughs> went to them and asked, Where is Master Gotama staying sir? now, sirs? We want to see Master Gotama. The Blessed One has entered the great wood, Satchika, and is, st is sitting at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Satchika, the Nigantha's son, together with a large following of Lekavis, entered the great wood, went to the Blessed One, exchanged greetings with the Blessed One, and after this courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down at one side. Some of the Lekapis paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side. Some exchanged greetings with him, and when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down at one side. Some extended their hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One, Some and sat down at one side. Some pronounced their name and clan in the Blessed One's presence and sat down at one side. 
some kept silent and sat down at one side. So that gives you an idea that it's not always bowing, that they were respectful, but they, they weren't bowing machines as happens in Asia so often. When Sachika, the Nigantha's son, sat down, he said to the Blessed One, I would like to question Master Gotama on a certain point. If Master Gotama would grant me the favor of an answer to the question, ask what you like, Sachika. How does Master Gotama discipline his disciples and how is Master Gotama's instructions usually presented to his disciples? This is how I discipline my disciples, Satrika, and this is how I instruct my instruction usually presented to, it, to my disciples. Monk's material form is impermanent. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Formations are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. Monk's material form is not self. Feeling is not self. Perception is not self. Formations are not self. Consciousness is not self. All formations are impermanent. All things are not self. That is the way I discipline my disciples, and that is how my instruction is usually presented to my disciples. A simile occurs to me, Master Gotama. Explain how it occurs to you, Satrika, the Blessed One said. He's pulling him in right now. He's got the bait on the hook. Just as when seeds and plants, whatever their kind, reach growth, increase, and maturation, all do so in dependence upon the earth, based upon the earth, and just as when strenuous work, whatever kind are done, all are done in dependence on the earth, based upon the earth, so too, Master Gotama. A person has material form as self. Based upon material form, he produces merit or demerit. He's talking about his understanding of karma right now. A person has feeling as self. Based upon feeling, he produces merit or demerit. A person has perception as self. Based upon perception, he produces merit or demerit. A person has formations as self, and based upon formation, he produces merit or demerit. A person has consciousness as self, and based upon consciousness, he produces merit or demerit. Satchika, are you not asserting thus material form is myself? Feeling is myself, perception is myself, formations are myself, consciousness is myself? I assert thus, Master Gotama, material form is myself, feeling is myself, perception is myself, formations are myself, consciousness is myself. And so does this great multitude. What has this great multitude, multitude to do with you, Satchika? Please confine yourself to your own assertions alone. <coughs> then Master Gotama, I assert thus, material form is myself, is personal. Feeling is personal. Perception is personal. Formations are personal. Consciousness is personal. <coughs> what is he actually saying here? He's saying that 
he doesn't know how craving arises. He's, he's taking a very surface view of things. He doesn't understand that craving always manifests as tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. In that case, Satchika, I shall ask you a question in return. Answer as you choose. What do you think, Satchika? Would a head anointed noble king, for example, King Pasanati of Kosala or King Ajatasattu of Magadaha exercise the power of his own realm to execute those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, to banish those who should be banished? Master Gotama. A head, a, a, point, anoint, a head anointed noble king, for example, King Pasanati or King Ajatasattu, would exercise a power in his own realm to ex excuse, execute those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, and to banish those who should be banished. For even those oligarchic communities, societies such as the Vajrayans and the Milanians exercise the power in their own realm to execute those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, and to banish those who should be banished. So all the more so should the head anointed king such as King Pasanati or King Ajatasattu. He would exercise it, Master Gotama, and it would be worthy, be worthy to exercise it. What do you think, Satrika? When you say thus, material form is myself, do you exercise any power that material form as to say let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. When this was said, Satchika, the Nigantha's son, was silent. A second time the Blessed One asked the same question, and a second time Satchika, the Nigantha's son, was silent. Then the Blessed One said to him, Satchika, answer now. Now is not the time to be silent. If anyone, when asked a reasonable question up to a third time by the Tathagata, still not answer, his head splits into seven pieces there and then. Now, on that occasion, a thunderbolt wielding spirit holding an iron thunderbolt that burned, blazed, and glowed, appeared in the air above Satchika, the Nikantha's son, thinking, if Satchika, the Nikantha's son, when asked a reasonable question up to the third time by the Blessed One, still does not answer, I will split his head into seven pieces here and now. <coughs> The Blessed One saw the thunderbolt-wielding spirit, and so did Satchika, Nigantha's son. Then Nigantha, then Satchika, the Nigantha's son, was frightened, alarmed, and terrified, seeking his shelter, asylum, and refuge in the Blessed One himself. He said, "Ask me, Master Gotama. I will answer." What do you think? Satchika, when you say thus, material form is myself, do you exercise any power over that material form as to say, let my form be thus, let my form not be thus? No, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Satchika, pay attention how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before. 
and nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Sachika, when you say thus, feeling is self, do you exercise any power over feeling as to say, let my feeling be thus, let my feeling not be thus, no, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Sachika. Pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before. Nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Sachika, when you say thus? Perception is myself. See, all of these are proving that all of this is impersonal. You can't make your material form. I mean, you can't be an Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilder just by wanting it to happen. You can't make a feeling come up just because you want a pleasant feeling doesn't mean a pleasant feeling will arise. And the perception, <coughs> perception is the naming of the feeling. Is this pleasant? This is painful. This is neutral. You don't have any choice. Your perception puts that name on it as soon as it happens. Do you exercise any power over perceptions as to say, let my perception be thus? Let my perception not be thus? No, Master Gotama. <coughs> pay attention, Sachika, pay attention how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before. And nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Sachika? When you say thus, formations are myself, do you exercise any such power over those formations as to say, let my formations be thus? Let my formations not be thus? No, Master Gotama, pay attention, Sachika, pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Sachika, when you say thus, consciousness is myself? Do you exercise any such power over consciousness as to say, <coughs> let my consciousness be thus, let my consciousness not be thus? No. You don't have any power because how does consciousness arise? If you have good working eye, it hit color and form, that consciousness arises. Or when a sound and a good working ill, then that consciousness arises. You don't have any control over it. That's how contact comes to be. <coughs> pay attention, Satrika, pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Satchika, is material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Suffering, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama. What do you think, Satchika? Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Is perception permanent or impermanent? 
our formations, permanent or impermanent? Is consciousness permanent nor impermanent? Impermanent, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Suffering, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama, what do you think, Sachika? When one adheres to suffering, resorts to suffering, holds to suffering, and regards what is suffering thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself, could one ever understand suffering oneself or abide with suffering utterly destroyed? How could one, Master Gotama, know, Master Gotama? What do you think, Satrika? That being so, do you not adhere to suffering, resort to suffering, hold to suffering, and regard what is suffering thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. How could I not, Master Gotama? Yes, Master Gotama. And the question of how could he not? Interesting question. How could he not take that to be his self? Come on. Give me an answer. Not take that to be his self. Bye using the six R's. Why? Because you're letting go of the craving. There's nothing in the material world. There's nothing in the mental world. There's nothing in the world of sensation that is you. Now, when you were talking about the noting and that sort of thing that you were getting caught in. What were you doing? You were taking it personally. That's why your progress became very slow. So when you see that it's, it's there's nothing substantial about anything in the world we have to start letting go of the idea that it's personally mine. This is an important point. <clears throat> it is though a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, heartwood were to take a sharp axe and enter the wood, and there he would see a large plantain trunk, straight, young, with no fruit, uh, no fruit bud core. Then he would cut down at the root, cut off the crown, and unroll the, the sheaths, plankton, banana. You know what happens when you unroll a banana? But as he went on unrolling the leaf sheath, he would never come even to the sapwood. He alone, let alone the heartwood. So too, Satchika, when you are pressed question and cross question by me, your own assertions, you turn out to be empty, vacant, and mistaken. But it was you who made this statement before the Vasali assembly. I see no recluse or Brahmin, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, even one claiming to be accomplished and fully awakened, who would not shake, shiver, tremble, and sweat under the armpits if he were to engage in debate with me. Even if I were to engage in, bait, in debate with a senseless post, it would shake and shiver and tremble. 
if it were to engage in debate with me. So what shall I say of a human being? Now, there are drops of sweat on your forehead and they have soaked through your upper robe and fallen to the ground. But there is no sweat on my body now. And the Blessed One uncovered his golden colored body before the assembly. When this was said, Sachika, the Nigantha son, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. Then Dum Dumuka, the son of the Lekavis, seeing Sachika, the Nagantha's son, in such a condition, said to the Blessed One, a simile occurs to me, Master Gotama. Explain how it occurs to you, Dumuka. Suppose, venerable sir, not far from a village or town, there was a pond with a crab in it. And then a party of boys or girls went from the town or village to the pond, went into the pond and pulled the crab out of the water and put him on dry land. And when it, whenever the crab extended a leg, they would cut it off, broke it, smashed it with sticks and stones. So that crab, with all of his legs cut off, broken, smashed, would be unable to get back to the pond as before. So too, all Sachika, the Nigantha's son, contortions, writhings, and vacillations have been cut off, broken, and smashed by the Blessed One. Now, he cannot get near the Blessed One again for the purpose of debate. When this was said, Sachika, the Nigantha's son, told him, Wait, Dumaka, wait. We are not speaking with you. Here we are speaking with Master Gotama. When this was said, uh, then he said, let Master Gotama, let be that, let be Master Gotama, that talk of ours of ordinary recluses and Brahmins. It was mere prattle. But, in what way is a disciple of Master Gotama, one who carries out his instructions, who responds to his advice, who has crossed beyond doubt, become free from perplexity, gained intrepidity, and became independent of others in the teacher's dispensation? Good question. Here, Sachika, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, near or far, a disciple of mine sees all material forms as it actually is with proper wisdom, thus, proper wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatever, any kind of perception whatever, any kind of formation whatever, any kind of consciousness whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external. So that's just what I was saying, isn't it? <clears throat> gross or subtle, inferior or superior, near or far, a disciple of mine sees all consciousness as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. In this, it, it is in this way that a disciple of mine is one who carries out my instruction, who responds to my advice, who has crossed beyond doubt, become free from perplexity, gain intrepidity, 
and become independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. Why does he become independent? Because he saw it directly for himself. Any time you start to worry about something, who's worrying? Who's causing themselves pain? Who's causing themselves doubt? Who's causing themselves all kinds of anxiety? I am. Anything that you take personally means that you have craving in your mind at that time. And there is tension and tightness in craving. That's how you recognize it. So the more you use the six R's in your daily activities, and then you go and you start to sit and your mind is all active and all kinds of weird things come up because of your activities during the day. What do you do with that? When you see your mind's attention has been pulled away, you use six R's. You don't wish for that to stop. All you do is see it for what it is. It's just ramblings of mind. It's okay for it to ramble. It's okay for that distraction to be there. It has to be okay because that's the truth. What do you do when you see that? You see how you start causing your own suffering and you let that suffering go by relaxing, letting go of that craving. And as soon as you relax, you'll notice you don't have those thoughts at that time. They might come up again fairly quickly, but that doesn't matter. What you do with what uh, uh, occurs in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. <coughs> if you take it personally, you can look forward to having a future of a lot of fear and anxiety and doubt or if you choose to 6R and just let it be there. Now you're not 6Ring to stop mind from doing anything. You're, you're just not keeping your attention on it. When you were noting, you were keeping your attention on it. So you get back to your object of meditation and go away real quick. So take a little bit more mindfulness in how you do that to yourself, how you cause yourself problem by taking these thoughts and these uh, feelings and sensations personally. Six are that. It has to be okay that these things are there. That's the Dhamma. That's the Dhamma of the present moment. Can't fight with the Dhamma. You can't control the Dhamma. You can't make the Dhamma be the way you want it to be. The only thing you can do with Dhamma is allow it to be there and relax, smile, come back to your object of meditation. Now there's a lot of books on what to do with hindrances when they arise. And some of these books are written by very famous monks but that doesn't mean they really understood it. The whole thing with this practice of following what the Buddha teaches is to realize that the most important part of your practice is using the six R's and not getting involved with whatever arises. 
That's the cause of suffering when you do that. And when you take something personal and you have repeat thoughts, what that means? You have craving in your mind and you're suffering because of it. So you let go of that. Relax. Smile. Keep it light. You're not using the six R's as a stick to beat away anything. You're allowing everything to be the way it is. <clears throat> but when you don't keep your attention on it, it gets weaker. No, it's not going to do that right away with some things. And that's okay. So your mind goes back and does the same thing again. Fine, it can do that. It has to be fine because that's what it's doing. But as you keep relaxing and letting go of that craving, eventually that the attachment to that gets so small that it fades away. Now, a lot of times people have this idea that you're supposed to fight with the, the hindrance and push it away and clutch your teeth together and press your tongue against the roof of your mouth and crush mind with mind. There was somebody that wrote an article and they said they, they did oh, it's either a six or eight month retreat, a private retreat. The first three months he had the hindrance. Why did he have it? Because he was taking it personally. Because he was causing himself so much suffering. He probably wanted to get up and and run away. But he, he just said, oh, I know I can overcome this. Well, he can't overcome it. All he can do is allow it to be. Now, when I went to a translator and I started laughing about clutching your teeth and pushing your tongue against the roof of your mouth. I said, that's not part of the Buddha's teaching. And he said, well, I've had to do that on occasion. And my question to him was, who had to do it? Who? And he didn't answer. He, he was taking it personally and trying to control. Now eventually, if you, play, if you practice one-pointed concentration, you can get control over that and the force of the concentration pushes it down. But When you practice one-pointed concentration and the force of the concentration pushes the hindrance away so it won't come up, that doesn't mean the hindrance is gone. That means that you've postponed it for a little while and you get to do it again. Hindrances are your best teacher by far. They teach you so many important lessons. The hindrances are your teacher. They're showing you where your pain and suffering are and how to let it go. So the more you can do that and realize that every time you get serious about something, who's serious? See? You see how it works. Now your mind is starting to get light. Now you're starting to see, oh, this is a lot more fun than I ever thought it would be. And you learn a lot, but you're teaching yourself those lessons. That's why the Buddha's uh, disciples, they don't need anybody to tell them what the suffering is and how to let go of it. They become arahats. They haven't got any more craving. 
anytime you get serious, anytime you get emotional, who is causing your suffering? Oh, he did, because he said that. doesn't matter. The, one of the reasons I've been so attracted to Buddhism all these years and that I keep studying and I keep learning is because you have to take self-responsibility. You can't blame the outside world for what you're going through. You have to see where your attachments are and how that affects the way you think and act. As you develop your equanimity more in your daily practice, that equanimity starts to carry out into your everyday life. And what somebody used to say and get you angry, now they say it and you go, hmm. Okay, you can say that. It's your opinion. That doesn't have anything to do with me. It's okay. So you're starting to see more and more that anytime you get serious with something and try to get in control, who wants the control? who wants it to be the way they want it to be, when they want it to be that way, and how often does that really happen? <coughs> Master Gotama, in what way is a monk an arahat with taints destroyed, who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, Reached his own, reached his own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely liberated through final knowledge. Here, Satchika, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. A monk has seen all material form as it actually is with proper wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And through not clinging, uh, uh, not craving and clinging, he is liberated. Any kind of feeling, whatever, any kind of perception, whatever, any kind of formation, whatever, any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. A monk has seen all consciousness as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And through not craving and clinging, he is liberated. It is in this way that monks, uh, that a monk is an arahat with taints destroyed who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached his own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely liberated through final knowledge. That statement, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, you can shorten it. When you see that you're getting attached, you see you're getting emotional, is this me? Is this who I am? Oh, no. Then you can relax and you can smile because you know it's not you. It's just old habit coming up and you can laugh with it. The more you laugh with yourself about getting caught, the less you are caught the more you see the impersonal nature of everything. 
And that's being free from suffering. <coughs> when a monk's mind is, is thus liberated, he possesses three unsurpassable qualities. Unsurpassable vision, unsurpa unsurpassable practice, and unsurpassable deliverance. When a monk is thus liberated, he still honors, respects, reveres, and venerates the Tathagata thus. The Blessed One is awakened, and he teaches the Dhamma for the sake, for the sake of becoming awakened. The Blessed One is tamed, and he teaches a Dhamma for taming oneself. The Blessed One is at peace, and he teaches the Dhamma for the sake of peace. The Blessed One has crossed over, and he teaches a Dhamma for crossing over. The Blessed One has attained Nibbana, and he teaches the Dhamma for attaining Nibbana. When this was said, Satchika, the Nigantha's son, replied, Master Gotama, we were bold and impudent in thinking that we could attack Master Gotama in debate. A man might attack a, a mad elephant and find safety, yet he could not attack Master Gotama and find safety. <laughs> He's kind of eating his words a little bit. A man might attack a blazing mass of fire and find safety, yet he could not attack Master Gotama and find safety. A man might attack a terrible poisonous snake and find safety, yet he could not attack Master Gotama and find safety. We were bold and impudent in thinking that we could attack Master Gotama in debate. Why is that? Because Master Gotama only spoke the truth. And he had a lot of patience, which is patience leads to Nibbana. That's what I was told very often by Sayada Usilananda. So the whole point of this sutta is showing how the Buddha could take any subject and turn it into a Dhamma and make you see for yourself uh, this is right. You can't argue with it because this is the way things actually are. Let the Blessed One together with the Sangha of monks consent to accept tomorrow's meal with me. The Blessed One consented in silence. Then knowing that the Blessed One had consented, Satchika, the Nigantha son, addressed the Lekavis. Hear me, Lekavis, I re the recluse Gotama, together with the Sangha of good monks, has been invited by me for tomorrow's meal. You may bring to me whatever you think would be suitable for him. Of course, you know the Buddha never traveled with any less than 500 monks. Then when the night had ended, the Lekavis brought 500 ceremonial dishes of milk rice as gifts of food. Then Satchika, the Nigantha son, had good food of various kinds prepared in his own park and had the time announced to the Blessed One, it is time, Master Gotama, the meal is ready. Then, it being morning, the Blessed One dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, he went to the, with the Sangha of monks to the park of Satchika, the Nigantha's son, and sat down at one and a seat made ready. Then with his own hands, Satchika, the Nigantha's son, served and satisfied the Sangha of monks, 
headed by the Buddha with various kinds of good food. When the Blessed One had eaten and put his bowl aside, Satchika, the Nigantha son, took a low seat. Now that in itself shows that he has a lot of respect. Sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, may the merit and the great meritorious fruits of this act of giving be for the happiness of the givers. Satchika, whoever comes about from giving to a recipient such as yourself, one who is not freed from lust, not free from hate, not free from delusion, he doesn't understand craving, that will be for the givers. Whatever comes from giving to the recipient such as myself, one who is free from lust, free from hate, free from delusion, that will be for you. He just gave him a big gift. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So the, the thing that you have to remember is repeat thoughts are thoughts of create with creating in it. They're thoughts of this is who I think I am. And I don't like this or I do like this. And you get clinging to it and you keep holding on to it and this opinion or idea it can pop up very often what you think and ponder on that's the inclination of your mind so what you want to do is get in the habit of smiling laughing having fun with whatever you're doing very important as you do that, your mind gets more and more in a state of balance. And with that balance, you can see when emotional states start to come up and you start going, ah, look at this one. That's nothing. Other people around you will notice that you are changing. And they will say, you know, you're changing and I want some of that. Whatever you're going through is really a good one. So that way you can help other people. And you help them not by giving some kind of serious talk. You help them by being the example and having fun. So many people come to me especially in Asia, and they say, I want to be a teacher. I want to teach other people. That's what everybody wants. Well, you can be a teacher, sure. But you don't teach with words. You teach by example. You teach by having a balanced mind. You teach by remembering that everybody that you meet wants the same exact thing thing. They want to be happy. So show them how to be happy. That's how you turn into a teacher. Okay? So, grump. <laughs> I have to pick on you once in a while. I know. <laughs> If I could only get him to smile more often. <laughs> Do you have any question? Your last chance.
what conditions may intend us to be more fruitful or more powerful? Practicing your generosity. And I'm not talking necessarily about material things, but I'm also talking about material things. What do you give other people? You say things that make them happy. You help them so they can be happy. And you think of them as being happy. The imaging power of your mind is very great, especially when you start purifying it like you're doing now. So if you start imaging your family as being more happy and having fun, you'll start seeing that happening because of the purity of your image. Doesn't have anything to do with you it has to do with holding the image and wishing other people well and helping them whenever you can. That's the first part. Tomorrow morning they're going to give you five precepts. Don't break them. Okay? And the longer you can keep the precepts without breaking them, the more successful meditation becomes, the easier everything becomes. So it's a real important aspect of the teaching that when other people see you keeping the precepts, oh, come on, let's have a beer together. No, thank you. I'll have some water. I want to be with you and be in company with you, but I'm not going to break my precepts. They won't like that at first, but you have to be tough. And sometimes if you if you ask for a ginger ale or something like that, it looks like you're... Maybe we could, you know, we could change the, change the table on that you and your friend, hey, let's go for a non-alcoholic beer. Just completely. Well, Well, they want to drink wine, go get some grape juice. Let's go get some grape Let's go get some milk. <laughs> oh. Chocolate milk. Well, there are some things that I... <laughs> if you drink it, it's all the virgin drinks, too. Yeah. The, you know, I particularly like Virgin Mary's. It's it, it's uh, tomato juice, but it has other other vegetables in it, and it's a nice taste. <coughs> anyway, as your friends start to see that, and that you're you're not following it because somebody told you to follow it but because you see that if you break a precept that you'll feel guilty about it, then they will start to respect you for that. And that's again how you become a teacher. And you need to sit every day. A couple hours is good. At one time. One of the things that Doug was got into the habit of was every time he was sitting only for two hours. And I kept on saying, why don't you sit a little longer? And finally he did and he went, oh yeah, that's where I wanted to be all the time. He was breaking his sitting a little bit too early. 
So when your meditation is good and you have the time, continue. And one of the things that I highly recommend is sitting in the morning. Yeah, I know you got to go to work, you got to go to school, you got to do all this stuff. I had some students in Malaysia that they had children and they had to be at school at six o'clock in the morning and they were getting up 3.30 in the morning and sitting before they took, it, took their children to school and then went to work. And the people at work started going, oh, I'm seeing something very different about you. You don't get so excited like you used to. What are you doing? Then he would tell them. But it, you find that it is worth it to sit for as long as you possibly can and try not to set a timer on it. Timers are not your friend. As you continue to purify your mind, you will become more successful. That's the way it works. So, any other question? Come on. <laughs> we use these two words in Zen and distraction. Are they the same thing? Yeah, I, I like the word distraction better because it's easier understood than a hindrance. If you try to figure out what the hindrance is, now you're thinking about it. But if you just call it a distraction, it just pulls your attention away. It doesn't matter what it is. You let it be and smile and come back after you relax. Okay? Yes. I have a greater appreciation for the word suffering being used as a description of dukkha compared to some sections who do not wish to use the word suffering because uh, they feel as that's too harsh. Yeah. And um, but with this um, understanding the personality, the impersonal process, this suffering is evident. Oh yeah. Could you? Put some more words to that, to along the lines of um, how it progresses. It doesn't seem as though it's suffering. But the suffering is there. Well, any time there's any craving in your mind at all, that is a form of suffering, mm -hmm. because you're taking what it is personally. And that's one of the reasons that I particularly like this sutta because it makes it very clear that all of these things are impersonal and anybody that has lust, hatred or delusion they have craving in their mind and that pulls you away from doing and acting in a way that's wholesome The only unwholesome thing that you actually do is take it personally. And that is where the suffering actually is. Sometimes I use the word unsatisfactory, but it depends on what I'm talking about. I find suffering to be, it's, it's a big word, kind of not as big as formations or sankara, but it is a big word because there is disturbance and there is distraction and all of those disturbances and distractions are caused by craving 
and that's the cause of suffering. Okay? You know it all. Unlike the ocean. Because there's low tide and there's mid tide and there's high tide and then there's all the different variations of the water on a lake. You know, when you look at a lake, sometimes it gets flat like glass, but the ocean actually handles that. So he's saying he's right. You know, like we, there's always something wow. that's not finding there. You mean he actually did something and it was right? I got this other part. Yes, I and understand. He, he, he can get a picture of it from Majin Nikai number 141 because in that one they gave one paragraph for every single piece of the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So the word suffering is like a word inside two little parentheses. <coughs> it has a lot of ramifications. It is helpful now when you go home. What I would suggest is every now and then pick up the Majjhima Nikaya and just open it up to a page and go, oh, okay, that's this one. Let's see what it says. You'll understand it. And that that will help a lot. That's that's the advantage of staying more than a week. Because if you stay for a couple of weeks or even a month, you get enough dhamma talks that you really start to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm starting to see that, and I see it in my practice, and I see it in myself, and and how I cause my myself pain. And you start letting it go. Then when you pick up the suttas, they make sense. If you pick up what somebody else wrote, you might notice that some of the stuff doesn't make such good sense. So I stick pretty close to uh, the suttas. And I, I highly recommend if you start getting into the study that you not only use the middle link sayings but you also use the Samyut Nikaya. Those two to me are the best. And Samyut Nikaya I say you want to you want to see what the Buddha said about dependent origination. You got 84 suttas just on dependent origination. And it shows you the last the last three, they show you what to look for in a teacher and how to use your your effort in the right way. And finding the right teacher for you. So it's, there's a lot that can be learned. Sometimes they repeat themselves, but that doesn't matter. You start, you start studying it, like the, the one sutta that I use a lot in the, in the uh, Samyut Nikaya, it's about ascetics and Brahmins. And the reason that I like it is because you see dependent origination very clearly 
but you also see the four links in each, the, the four noble truths in each link. But you got to know what you're looking for before you actually see it. And it gets to be fun. It really does. I mean, I've been entertained by this stuff for years. And every now and then you run across something that, oh, wow, that's really right. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's good fun. Anyway, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.